somebody was there. It was more than one person that done this. Mm -hmm. And somebody knows. And they set him up on that road to make it look like a hit and run. I was so happy when they reopened the case. Um, and that gave me hope. And he wasn't under the rock anymore. And with all this stuff going on, you know, he gets more attention now. But we really don't want that attention. We just want the answers. So well stated by Sandy Smith, you know. We'd be better off if, we, if she didn't have the attention. That would mean that she's got the answers that she's looking for. The answers that every mother deserves. How and why was my son killed? That's the mother of, of Stephen Smith. Um, looking for just answers. Another big, big story in the low country of South Carolina we're talking about tonight. I want to put up on the screen what the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division released today. Um, they sent out this note. They said, SLED's investigation into the death of Mr. Smith was never closed. It remains a homicide investigation. Progress has been made and SLED's investigation is active and ongoing. Since the beginning of SLED's investigation, the goal has been to find out how Mr. Smith died and find the person or persons responsible for his death. To that end, SLED Chief Mark Keel has assigned additional SLED low country regional agents to work this case in the hopes that those who may know what happened to Mr. Smith are more willing to speak freely now than they may have been in 2015 or in 2021. That's fascinating. I mean, people know stuff down there. I'm sorry, people know stuff. There's a million rumors, but you need people coming to you with, with some facts and then facts that you can corroborate and people have to be, feel confident that they can come forward and tell the truth and that nothing's going to happen to them. And that's what they're hoping now is the time. So let me bring in our guest joining us tonight in Charleston, South Carolina, partner at Bland Richter, LLC, an attorney for Sandy Smith. Ronnie Richter is with us. Also joining us from Charleston, South Carolina, former in investigative consultant for the Smith family, Steve Peterson. Uh, thank you both for joining me. I really do appreciate it. Um, Ronnie, big press conference yesterday you guys had. Uh, big, uh, um, you know, this, this is like starting from, from ground zero all over again. I feel like there's a level of momentum and a level of attention now in light of what happened in the Murdoch trial that, that maybe things will loosen up, trying to get some of the information that you're trying to get. Yeah, I think that's the hope, right, Vinny, that uh, now we will get some momentum. Now resources are being applied here when they might have been diverted to the Murdoch matter, and we could certainly understand uh, the drain on resources that the Murdoch investigation had on a small state like South Carolina, but it's Sandy's turn. And so I appreciate you, uh, you know, helping to shine a spotlight on this. You know, sunlight is the great antiseptic, as they say. And I do think, as you highlighted in your comments, obviously people have talked over the last eight years, and it's just critical now that we ride this wave of momentum and that people get out in the field and they reach folks with information so we can track down the leads to finally find out what happened to Stephen. Uh, uh, Stephen, what are, what are your thoughts tonight about people coming forward and, and speaking now that maybe <clears throat> weren't speaking freely before? You, you were, you know, taking a look at this case and what happened. Uh, you know, did you get the feeling back then that, hey, people aren't telling me everything that they know? <laughs> well, I think that's probably an understatement, Vinny. <laughs> Nobody was comfortable talking back then. And when I say back then, it was only two years ago, or not even. It was right after the deaths of Maggie and Paul Murtaugh. Stephen was killed in 2015. And nobody seemed to really want to be coming forth back then. And uh, this case kind of ping-ponged back and forth between the Highway Patrol and SLED. And it just kind of died on the vine uh, by, by Christmas of 2015 and it sat um, stagnant until SLED announced after the Murtaugh murders that they were gonna reopen the investigation. And uh, you know, yesterday's announcement or even today's announcement that they've deemed it a homicide, from my perspective, it's always been a homicide. So I'm glad that SLED is looking into this. I hope that they'll put forth the same effort they did at convicting Alex and uh, and give it towards uh, Stephen so that Sandy can get the answers she needs 
and that she can move forward with some peace. Absolutely. So, so Ronnie, give us an idea of, of what you guys are doing. You're, you're putting together a team. What are you guys going to do here? Yeah, so this is before we got the phone call from Chief Keel, which I'm sure we're going to talk about. But when we got engaged, it was to try to break this stalemate, right, to try to get this thing moving again. And so uh, through GoFundMe, and thank you anyone who donated to that cause, resources were, uh, were gathered, which would allow us to petition for a private exhumation and autopsy of Stephen's body to answer the first threshold question, which is what happened to Stephen. We never accepted the idea that this was a vehicular accident. Um, all the physical evidence at the scene would point otherwise. So the first question that has to be answered is the what question, right? So through the private autopsy, and we've spoken with both local and national experts who've done this before, who've exhumed bodies of this age and have examined them, we're, we intend to get the answer to that first threshold question. Stephen, what are your thoughts about what, what happened on that road? And how would you describe, you know, where he was found and, and what that area is like? Well, it's very deserted. It's very rural. Uh, it was in the middle of the night. It's a road very less traveled. So, um, you know, after, our, after we reviewed all the information that we were able to obtain, again, by the time I got involved, it was after SLED announced that they were reopening the case. So from that point forward, now it's an open investigation. So agencies are not forthcoming. They're not sharing information. They won't allow us to speak to the pathologist who conducted the autopsy of Stephen. We're trying to drag information from them, but nobody is being forthcoming in any of this. So eventually SLED began to cooperate and we were sharing information. They shared a little with me. I shared everything I had with them. So we came up with two theories on what happened to Stephen. One it possibly involved members of the Murtaugh family, and the other theory didn't, unless the Murtaughs got involved later on and were involved perhaps in some type of effort to cover it up. We didn't quite get that far. But uh, based on SLED's information to me, we could discount the involvement of Buster and Paul because they claimed they had evidence proving that neither were in the county the night that Stephen was killed. So if theory A involves Buster or Paul, and theory B does not, if you take away theory A, you're kind of left with theory B. But there's holes in both, because theory B involves a vehicle. And it, you're right, it doesn't make sense. The shoes are left on his body, his, the body's positioning. I don't believe he was killed somewhere else and dropped where he was found. There was way too much blood at that scene. And without sounding too gory, if you had killed Stephen somewhere else and dumped his body there, he would have bled out before not a, uh, explaining the amount of blood at the scene in the middle of the road. I can't explain his body positioning. I can't explain a lot of things. So, but based on my interviews, I interviewed what I believe to be the driver of the vehicle that may have struck Stephen. And I was convinced after my interview, this guy's involved. I relayed all that information to SLED. All right, Steve Peterson, interesting stuff. And Ronnie Richter staying with us. Uh, we've got more on this investigation plus coming up next hour. <laughs> On the docket tonight in Miami, Florida, jealous supermarket mogul Manuel Marine accused of hiring two men to kill his wife's lover. Tonight, we take a look at day one of this shocking trial. He had a beautiful house. He had a beautiful family. And he threw that all away because his wife was cheating. An otherworldly mystery. Linda believes people in government were alien reptilian creatures. She fell for a con man and his lies, but did she have anything to do with the murder of his ex-wife? This is nothing but a game to him. It was a flawless plan. If it wasn't flawless, you would have solved the murder by now. I think every person is capable, under the right conditions, of murder. Someone they knew with Tamron Hall. All new episode tomorrow, 7, 6 Central. Only on Court TV.
was it suspicious to you? Yes. Why? Because he wasn't been in the road. Um, he had a cell phone in his pocket. It wouldn't be the first time he had to call for somebody, you know. And um, but the car was locked. He had his phone and his key in his pocket. But then he left his wallet. So if you're going to go get gas, why would you leave your wallet in the car? And he wouldn't walk. It, no, he would have walked through the woods. He would not have been in that road. I, I don't know what happened to Stephen Smith. We've, we've got to find this out, though. I'd be because he's dead in the middle of the road, and if it was a hit and run, if it was, that's still a crime, and that person is still out here. Uh, still with us, Ronnie Richter. He's the attorney for Sandy Smith. Um, working with Eric Bland, who you've seen many times on this show. Uh, Stephen Peterson, investigative consultant, worked uh, for the family. Stephen, I just have to follow up on what happened before the break. You, you mentioned that you believe that you spoke, did you speak with the driver of the vehicle, you think, who may have been there and involved in all of this? Yes. And yes, when was this? How long him. ago? This was m maybe in August, maybe September of 2021. Of 2021? So just yes, okay. just after. So it's just someone who's still in the area, someone who's still there, and you've given the name to in investigators. Yes, yes. All right. Uh, they interviewed a lot of people associated with this. They interviewed even a, a, an ex-cop who was fired for some issues, who allegedly or reportedly, according to the North Carolina, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina Highway Patrol, took photographs of the vehicle involved. And then that officer turned them over to the highway patrol. When I interviewed the officer, he had no memory of any of this. And I'm like, wait a minute, how do you not remember this? How many, how many unsolved murders or how many dead people in the road do you guys have in Hampton that you wouldn't remember this? This should stick out in your memory. So nobody wanted to talk about this at all back right after the Murtaugh murders when I got involved. Wow. Well, Ronnie, hopefully things are turning around. Now, you spoke with Sled. Um, how did that conversation go? No, it was great. I mean, it's not every day that we didn't just talk to Sled. We talked to Chief Keel. So we talked to the state's top cop. So it's it was momentous for us that we weren't just being contacted by a Sled agent to say, hey, guys, we're still out here. This was Chief Keel himself calling Eric Bland and myself to tell us. You know, hey guys, if you're doing this exhumation of the body to try to prove something to us that that you think it's a murder and, and we're treating it as something else, you don't have to do that. We we believe this was a homicide and we're on the case. And so, again, to have that level of commitment from that that level of an official is pretty reassuring that things are happening. So, uh, Stephen, what are your thoughts now? Post Murdoch double murder conviction, right? national spotlight, international spotlight on the low country, this part of the low country, South Carolina. Do you, do you think things are going to turn around here? Do you think Ronnie and his team um, will have more of an opportunity to get to the truth because maybe people start speaking? Well, you know, because Alex is gone, it doesn't dissolve the influence that the family still has down in the low country. There are still Murtaugh's that are out there and have a, a lot of influence. So maybe Alex is not personally out there doing stuff, but he has brothers and so forth who are involved. And I'm not saying they're involved in anything criminal. I'm not saying they would they would do anything to obstruct anything, but people are afraid because their livelihoods depend on, on the arrangements and relationships that they have. So people still may be reluctant. I hope not. Um, when... They were looking at Alex and or the Murtaugh murders before they had named Alex as their their suspect. The state had impaneled a grand jury. And I was told that the Stephen Smith investigation was going to be part of that grand jury. So I put together a list of what I believe to be in the Stephen case. Remember, I had nothing to do with the Murtaugh's or any of that. I'm purely looking at Stephen. I'm just trying to find answers for Sandy. And I gave a list of witnesses to the to SLED and I said, put these guys before the grand jury. Get them on record. Lock them in now. Because if we can prove that any one of their statements are false, then you've got to charge against somebody. And if you charge the people that are on the periphery, you'll be able to get somebody to roll. And at this point, almost eight years after the Stevens death, 
you're going to need a cooperating witness. Absolutely. All right, we're going to continue this another day. Ronnie Richter, Stephen Peterson, thank you so much. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Vinny. We'll be back. Hey, thanks for having us.